Welcome to A Wash With Colour and the spectacular scenery of the High Morns. If you're prepared to get off the beaten track, then the gentle slopes and rocky crags make fantastic painting locations. My guest today is no stranger to high peaks, and a little later, I'm going to take him down into the lowlands to try his hand at an architectural scene in watercolours. Kilkeel is the capital of the Kingdom of Morn, or so the locals would have you believe. Fishing, which has long been the lifeblood of this busy coastal town, may be in decline, but it still boasts one of the biggest fleets in Ireland. The landscape of the Morns lends itself to the craft of painting. In this area the past is ever present and traditional building skills are carried on today. Well, tell me, Philem, when did the tradition of stone walling start? Well, the tradition of stone wall building started quite a few centuries ago. Whenever they began to clear the land for agricultural purposes, they can trace it way back to a couple of three thousand years ago, some of these stone walls. And it's all dry wall. There's no mortar, no lime, no anything to help me get. And this single wall that we're looking at is a single ditch. It was, it was built through balance, complete balance. The stones had to be worked. Every stone had to be worked. No line, no rule, nothing. What was your eye measured everything. And when did you get involved with it? I got involved in 1958. I left school very early. <laughs> with an uncle of mine, which was, he was very good. He, he learnt me the trade. And a few years I picked it up. And I've been at it ever since that. What's the secret to building a dry stone wall? You, you have to read the stone. If I could explain it, the stone, building a stone wall is not like building an ordinary wall with brick or brick, because all these stones are individuals, just like I said, different shapes, different sizes, everything. Some go into place, some have a persuaded to go into place. And you must know, by looking at that wall, you lay the, lay the bottom stone first, it's called the, the butt stone, that's the bottom stone. Lay that stone laid, then you look around for the second stone. Now, you must read that stone on the ground before you bring it over. You must say, that's going to fit there, nearly like a jigsaw puzzle. And that's the whole secret, and be able to read the stone without measurement or anything. Why are there so many walls here in the Morns? Well, the Morn is a very stony area, you know, and they, they do serve a good purpose. First of all, to keep the stock in place, keep the stock in from, from wandering, right? They also are, are a great, terrific shelter belt. Now, when you look at the stone wall, you can look through the stone wall, little, little holes, as we say in it. Right? When the wind hits that, it doesn't flop over. It filters through. Now, that makes very easy living for the animals. I even saw animals in the, in the winter time lying there in shari wah and getting dried with the wind coming through. And it's everlasting. It's not like fencing nor, nor hedging. No, nothing can destroy it. Fire can destroy hedge. Can't destroy stone. Sprays can destroy wire. Can't destroy stone. It's there forever. It's not easy to make a living in these mountains, but the Morn man is very adaptable, part farmer, fisherman and shepherd. 
and throughout all the hardship they've never lost their sense of humour. Did you hear the one about the Kilkeel man, who was asked was he a seafaring man? And he answered, no, I'm a far-seeing man. I had the wit to get out of it. And I had the good fortune to meet up with one such man, PJ Sloan, a farmer who had the wit to get out of it. But the draw of the morns proved to be too strong. Having left these mountains over 30 years ago, for the endless plains of Canada, PJ returned to work the foothills he walked as a child. It's a very old road, that. What was it used for? Well, the road, it's, uh, I believe in older days, it was for me and Kilkeel, the Hilltown Road, and farmers used it, and people who wanted to go towards the Windy Gap and through. Uh, and they also, they took granite stones down to the, uh, to the roadway down there, and it was hauled by trucks and whatever. You have a bit of an accent, and I know it's not from the Morns. Where did that all come from? I was in Canada for 20 years. Right. Uh, I inherited my dad's home. I came back here to live with my wife, and uh, we were home here, and uh, we have a little son came along. So we're all happy with it. And what is it, PJ, that makes this area so special? To come here at 6 o'clock in the morning in the month of June or July with the sun shining on you, the birds singing, up at the Eagle Rock, the eagles going, is fantastic. What was it like to grow up here as a child? Well, you grow up, you're uh, wanting to go, wanting to play football, and you get the call, you get the shout at you from, from Dad, go check the sheep on the mountain. So you go wandering along, and whenever you're 12 or 14 going along and looking around you, you get different thoughts, whereas living in a city or something, you don't see these things. The occasional fox will pop out on you. Uh, rabbits, just a dream. Listen, PJ, I'm looking for my guest. I don't know where he's got to, but thanks a lot anyway. Well, in the end, it was probably much easier to let my guest find me. Dawson Stelfox is an architect by profession, but he is also a celebrated mountaineer having scaled many of the highest peaks in the world, including Everest. D Dawson, how are you? Hi, thanks. Yeah, Have a seat. Good day. Yeah. I've just been doing a bit of a sketch here Hi, of the yeah. tours the tours of Vinya. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just get rid of this, Dawson. Mm. So when did the interest in mountaineering begin, Dawson? <laughs> well, I've been walking these hills for a long time. It's it's been in my blood since I was a youngster, really, and started in the morns, got the bug here, really, and then started travelling, you know, to the other mountains of Ireland, to Scotland, eventually to the Alps, and then further afield, you know, so it just, but it started, it all started in the morns. So it was from Sleeve Binion to Everest then? Yeah, that's right, I mean, it, it, and lots of other mountains in between, I mean, I think, I think once you do get the sort of the bug and the commitment to mountaineering, and then that's it, you've got it for life, really, you know, and, and you really do enthuse about it, and, and become so committed to it that, that Certainly, you know, any spare time you have yeah. is devoted towards trying to get out into the mountains. So, in fact, you're the first Irishman ever to have climbed Mount Everest. I was, yes, indeed, yeah. As part of a, as part of an expedition of eight climbers and then other support team as well from all over Ireland, from you know, from with climbers from Donegal, from Kerry, from Dublin, from Belfast. Uh, you know, I was, it was just really picking the, the people who we reckoned would work together as a good team and who had the experience to be able to climb it. So do you still get a buzz out of climbing Sleeve Binion? I do. I, lo I mean, I love the morns. I still, I still, any, I mean, any weekend would be spare, you know, we'd be down here, and the family, my wife and kids and family would be down here. And we still get as much of a kick out of climbing in the morns, you know. It's always, you don't, you don't try and rate them one or the other, you know, the, but the morns will always be special, because yeah. it's where I started. So I think it's nearly time we were headed down to the valley. We'll leave the peaks behind. I have a painting location in mind that I think you'll know very well. OK, Dermot, let's go. Dawson's passion for climbing has also given him a deep appreciation of nature and the countryside, but he believes that we are in danger of losing some of its most important landmarks. 
Tell me, Dawson, what is the history of Hannes Close? Well, we don't know precisely the date of any individual building here, Dermot, but we do know that the Hannah family came from Scotland and settled here about the middle of the 17th century. And they built over the years um, what's called now a clacken, uh, which is a family cluster of buildings grouped together for security, for shelter, and for sort of communal farming practices. And it's a very archaic form of, uh, form of settlement. Uh, there's very few left now. Um, and it was sur surpassed really by the individual house sitting in its own farmland around it. But here we've got all the family dwellings, extended family houses really, built around a very tight area um, with sort of communal land around them, fields that they would have shared in the agriculture. Well, would there have been many clackens like this in Northern Ireland? Well, they were, they were very common throughout Ireland, but there's very, now very few left. There's only really this one and one up near um, Fairhead up in the North Antrim coast would be the best to preserved and, and are actually listed as, as historic uh, buildings. Um, and they're about the only two left really now. There's remnants of others, but generally what's happened is that they, a lot of the buildings have fallen into disuse and you've got one individual farm has taken precedence over it. So they're very archaic and, as I say, they're very important now. So a lot of the work that you do at the present time would be preserving buildings just like this? Yes, I mean, really a lot of the work we've been doing here in the restoration of the close and some of the outlying buildings and other, and other cottages has been really trying to, trying to say that these are important buildings. You know, they're every bit as important as the, you know, the grand cathedrals and the city halls and, uh, you know, the sort of the, the posh buildings, if you like, because these, these buildings represent where most of us came from. You know, most of us come from an agricultural or rural background. Uh, most of our ancestors, even going back two or three generations, lived in buildings like this. Um, and it's important to keep them because it gives that sense of continuity, of history, of, of culture, of knowing where we come from, of, of putting our own place in the landscape. Well, I must say, Dawson, I'm your number one fan because it's buildings just like this that make perfect locations for watercolour paintings. Well, they fit in the landscape, don't they? I mean, that's it. They're part of the landscape. I mean, they're coming from a background where you're using local materials, local building traditions. They generally got trees around them. They're sort of snuggled into the landscape rather than standing on top of it. So I can see what you mean. I mean, they, they, they are very much to me, they're part of the landscape that you're painting. Well, Dawson, I suppose there's not much point in me asking you, have you ever drawn this before? Because I'm sure you've drawn it many times. We've drawn the individual buildings, but uh, but I think what they what the normal sort of architects drawn don't really show really is the positions, the relationship between the buildings. You know, so that's what you've picked up here, I think. Yeah, and I suppose in your in your sketches that you're doing as an architect, you don't have a lot of perspective coming into play then. No, most of the time we're drawing straight elevations and plans and yeah. sections and elevations, all the sort of straight views on. So rather than I say, and one of the fascinating things about the close is the way the buildings relate to each other. You know, they're all at odd angles and they're all certain little glimpses yeah. of views um, through the buildings. Yeah. You know. Well, I've looked around the whole close and this. This area of Hannah's Close here, where we're looking up between the buildings, and with the little red roof at the background, mm. and the beautiful yellow George's is that George's house, yeah, yeah, the yellow house, yeah. and this one here is Johnny's. Johnny's house, and yeah. I just like the way that they relate to each other with the mm. angles and the varying roof heights. Yeah, it's maybe the best location for a painting in the whole close. Aye. No, it's a very, it's a very attractive area because you see, you're, you're not none of it's straight on at all, is it? You know, they're yeah. all running at their own angles, and yet they're all relating to each other as well. Yeah, so very good. good. Well, how do you think you're going to handle this then? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm relying on your expertise, Darren. So, um, no, I mean, I think it, the fascinating thing is the glimpse to me of the of the red roofed um, barn building, sort of between the two gables. You know, that's the sort of just the glimpse of that, yeah. and then the uh, the hills behind. Mm -hmm. Well, the yeah. colours do work well together. The yellow and the red are very complementary, and then mm -hmm. we have the grey roof on the, on Johnny's here, and the white wall just to mm -hmm. give us a, a, a left hand or a right hand side mm -hmm. to the painting. Mm -hmm. So, I'm yeah. going to hand the pencil over to you, okay. Dawson, and. Right we can get started and what I would suggest you do is start with the, the corner of the yellow house. Right. That's about as much as you need, Dawson. Right, okay. And I must right. say, I'm not surprised that you've done so well. It really <laughs> looks it really looks very close to what we're, what we're looking at here. Right. Now you can see the verticals are all this vertical and the horizontals fall towards the horizon as they go away. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. enough about the sketch. We'll just go straight in now with the paint. Okay. So this is a mixture of uh, ultramarine and light red and with the big three quarter inch brush we're just going to put on some sky colour. Now I'm going to hand over to yourself and off you go. Keep this above the houses and then we can, yeah, and then we can shape the clouds. Now I'm just going to take your hand there for a second yeah, yeah. and if you want to shape a cloud pull down and this here becomes a cloud and then we'll soften those edges. Yeah. 
Right, I think that's enough of the sky. And you can see that it is a very mm -hmm. simple sky. Mm -hmm. If we yeah, have a fussy yeah. scene, we don't need a fussy sky. Sorry, right. okay. So let me take that brush. Okay. Now while we're waiting on that to dry completely, we can move on and put in the yellow mm -hmm. colour of the, the walls. Yeah. Now that is a mixture of winter yellow with raw sienna. That should give you a yellow ochre. Right, that's interesting because it was yellow ochre was the, what was added to the lime wash on that building when we were uh, restoring it. And that was what uh, the family told us was the traditional colour that house was painted. You know, so Very it's, good. So it's, <laughs> so you've got the right colour right. there. So we'll try that first of all and just see if it's strong enough or maybe that's not far away. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you take that you can wash over everything except that little plaque there. Right. And just cover the whole house with that. Right, okay. Because if the door is darker than the underlying wash, you don't need to worry about and it. You can go over the windows and uh, stuff. Over as well everything, and, yeah. yeah. Over the doors, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Anything this dark will go on top right. of the light right. colour. Right. But if you have a light colour underneath, you must retain that on this gable end wall as well. I'll just fill that for you again, Dawson. Right. There you go. And start up here at the top now and bring that down right up to the and the chimney, the chimney well, then, yeah. and the yeah. side of the chimney, yeah. that's it. Just keep it nice and neat around the edges. Well that's enough of the yellow. Now we can move on and put on that beautiful Bangor blue slate colour. Mm, that yeah. is Bangor blue, isn't it? It is, yeah. The slates come from Bangor, North Wales and um, they came quite early into the morns because of the stone trade across and little sort of fishing boats, uh, you know, going across to, to Wales and Liverpool, Manchester, and brought back slates. So the thatch disappeared quite early in the morns, really. And so Bangor Blue is what is really the prevalent roof yeah. material now. I'll be quite honest yeah. with you, Dawson. I always thought it was Bangor North Down. North down. <laughs> yeah. Well, sorry, disillusion everywhere, but it's uh, Bangor yeah. North Wales. Yeah. Well, that colour is made from uh, light red and ultramarine with a little bit of crimson into it. Right. And if we, first of all, find the top of the roof, just below the ridge tile, and then mm -hmm. pull it down mm -hmm. in the direction of the fall of the roof. Right. But yeah. just be careful not to touch your, touch your the yellow, the yellow yeah. Yeah. because so the blue will bleed into the yellow. So across the yeah. start and then. and then down. Don't take it right down to the bottom because there's a certain amount of algae growing on the slate, and it's always nice to show that. Mm. Right. And yeah. we'll feed in a bit of yellow towards the bottom yeah. so that it gives the impression of, of algae on the slate. And even there's not algae on it. <laughs> this it's always oh, nice well. to put it in anyway. Around here, I think there would yeah, be. Yeah, just watch the yellow. Now keep a bit of a, a little bit of a barrier between the yellow and the blue, just until it's completely dry. That's lovely. Now just bring this down slightly more. That's it. You have it. You've great control of that brush, Dawson. I must say. <laughs> It well, it's not through practice. No. Uh, well, it must be the same. It must be the same as the pencil. The pencil, yeah, so exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's fine, that's far enough. Now, we'll just go straight into the winter yellow and with the blue that's on the brush, we're going to get a very light greenish colour. And just by running that along the line of the, the spouting. Let it bleed into it a bit then. So and then encourage it to, to go up like that. Do you want to try that? Mm -hmm. Just bring it across here. That spouting's very dark, so it's not going to matter if you yeah, haven't got a... You're going to have a heavy, perfectly. heavy black line. Exactly. That's very nice. Well, we've moved it on quite a bit now, Dawson, mm -hmm. and you can see that we have used the same technique to put the tile roof on the white house. Mm -hmm. With a very loose wash of a light blue, mm -hmm. we have indicated that that is in partial shadow. Mm -hmm. And then the little corrugated tin roof on mm -hmm. the back shed to give us a little bit of depth. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do now is put a bit of a 3D effect into it. Right. And that should let us yeah. get the structure of the house. Mm -hmm. So with a mixture of light red and ultramarine in a very thin wash, I just wanted to cover the shadowed side of the building. That's it. And including the window and everything in, then, yeah. Yeah, including the window because it's uh, in complete shadow as well. How are you finding the technique yourself, mm, Dawson? It's fine, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I suppose it's just knowing how to... Like, it's, a, it's the right strength of colours to use so you get the colour coming through, really, isn't it? It's the critical thing here, isn't it? So you're not losing the, not losing the yellow. That's no. right. Mm. You don't want to lose the yellow at all. And it's just to give you that 3D effect. Mm -hmm. And you keep applying washes one on top of the other. 
the, the actual like line of the brush stroke is critical here. I mean, do you follow in any particular lines as you come down? Well, as a rule of thumb, you're better to paint something in the way that it grows or goes. So if right. a tree, for instance, is growing up, you paint the direction of the brush stroke up. Trump. And the wall mm. the wall is going up and down, you know, so mm -hmm. you either paint it up and down or back and forth. Now right. I'm gonna change brushes there for you right. and just to give that shadowed side on the reveal of the window. Just show a line of shadow coming shadow down. down and across the top as well. Exactly. Then, yeah. If you look out there you can see that there mm. is a definite yeah. colour change. That's it. And the other side mm -hmm. and down. That's quite a useful yeah, brush there for doing that because yeah. it comes to a fine yeah. point. That'll do, don't worry too much. I and mean, this side of the chimney as well. Yeah, well, that's all the shadows in underneath the eaves and around the windows. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to go and work on this pathway. And we want to show recession in the foreground, in the path. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it, it's very, very grey. Mm -hmm. And I personally yeah. don't like that. I think grey things look very flat. Yeah. So what we want to do is try and put a wee bit of life into it by yeah. using a nice tan colour, you know, a nice, if we can imagine that as cream and crimson. Mm. Right, <laughs> good imagination. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to use raw sienna with some crimson and lots and lots of water just to give us that nice dilute mix. Mm. And I want you to start at the furthest point and pull that back towards you, putting... Yeah, it's, it's, yeah so the lines are, sort of come back into a single point sort of thing, is yes. it? Yes. Yeah, and then radiating out. It's like perspective thing again, you yes. know, where it's all disappearing yes. off to a vanishing mm. point. That's it. Now, while that's drying, Dustin, we want to put some texture in there because it's not all, you know, as it's clear as that. Yeah. There's yeah. lots of little bumps in it and you've got heights and hollows. Mm. And we want to indicate that with texture. Yeah. And okay. we're going into the shadow colour again, which was ultramarine and light red. And yeah. just very quickly, this may look drastic at the beginning, we just pull a few lines through it. Like that. Mm, now yeah, that doesn't yeah. look drastic. It does, yeah. Now pull it quickly. That's it. And then we're going to take the same brush and we just wet that off, dry off the water, and then blend that through. Mm. Right. Just soften the edges. Those are really just sort of as the eye sort of looking at it in terms of receding up the up the page. Just don't the take idea? them all off now. Just leave yeah, some streaks. Yeah, yeah. But it it leads the eye in to the focal point. Mm. That's just about dry enough now, Dawson, to go on and put into the stonework here nice. on either side. Yep. Okay. So I'll take that okay. one off you. All right. And this is a mixture of burnt sienna and raw sienna with a little bit of ultramarine. And it's just to give a different tone between that mm. and the stonework. Yeah. Right. So are you picking out the individual blocks then in at this stage, are you? Then or are you going to... Well, why show for everything as much as we can? But right. you see the way the granite on the wall has mm. some white flecks? Yeah. It's not yeah. all the same colour. Yes, There's yeah, lots of white there. Right, I don't know yeah. what that is. Is that old yeah. salvage stone? It's all that, some of that's stone out of old buildings and things. So right. Some of it's, it's got lime wash, old lime wash on it. But off you go and yeah. just leave some of that lime wash right. while you're doing that. Okay. Would you actually going around the, the I edges think it of might the be stones, better just to yeah, do that, yeah. Just to pick out the stones themselves. Now leave some white. That's it. That's lovely, yeah. Well, what about art at school, Dawson? Had you an interest in art when you were at school? Well, I was never very good at it. I was interested in it, but uh, I much more went down this sort of technical drawing route rather than the, rather than the free expression um, line of it. So uh, I was never much good at the, uh, the free hand sketching and, uh, and things like that. What about the top of the wall? Just no, just leave it. I'll leave it for leave a moment. Then, so. Well, funny enough, yeah. you should say that I was more interested in the art and the technical drawing. I could never get straight lines. You used to use a big ruler. <laughs> like that, then, that's, yeah. that's lovely, yeah. yeah. Now, do this, the same over here. Just on the face again, then? Oh, no, you can do it top, top and face. Top and face, then, yeah. Try and join that up a slight bit there just to keep that uniform the whole way through. That's it. And then we'll put a shadow underneath on the back side of that stone so that it, you can fill that fill as well. That in, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that as well. Yep. Yeah. And then just bring that around with you. Now can you see by feeding in the the ultramarine and light red mix mm. into the granite it gives yeah. you that granulation effect. Mm. And they're bleeding into each other as well so those are both wet when you put them on. That's right. Yeah. Now yeah. try exactly the same thing on the other side okay. but use the number eight brush and I want right. you just to bleed it in on the side. Now it'll take very little mm. of it just down the side. If it creeps across the top don't worry about it mm. but just not here and there and just let it find its own way in. Mm. Long here. Long down, yeah. yeah. More towards the bottom and let it find its own way up. Just push it, encourage it to climb, that's it. Lovely. 
And it's given a lovely texture to it, mm, isn't it? It is, you know, real depth to it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I do a few strokes across the top just to and indicate. It, and it goes across the line of the, yeah. the top stones, yeah. That's lovely. A bit, bit more up there, that's still a little bit damp, so it should still bleed. You see, if the paint underneath is dry, it won't bleed it at all. It won't bleed in, yeah, so it just gets spots. Yeah. yeah. And a bit here as well, just a little bit. That's enough. Mm. Now, while you have that colour on the brush, I want you to put a shadow shadow here cast by yeah. that wall onto the pathway so yeah. there's the start of it and right. just pull it down towards you and, and it gets getting, wider getting, getting wider as it goes down yes. yeah just a wee bit more there thicken it out slightly that's it now don't have a straight top on it because the wall's not straight at the top just have a little broken that's it that's better and this here is up that side as well because you still have the shadow disappearing around the corner perfect Well, it looks good to me, Dawson. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah. I think it's near yeah. time you put your name on the bottom right-hand corner. Okay, just about here. Yeah. Then, yeah. Lovely. Okay, that's it then. Well, what do you think? Take it around for a it. Uh, I'm very impressed <laughs> by your ability. You know, so. Oh no, come on! Yeah. It's you know, all uh, I did was guide you through it. You know, yeah. you had it all to put on yourself. Yeah. Where are you going to hang it? Well, I spent years, two or three years, working on the restoration of this place, Dermot, so it'll, it'll definitely be going up on the walls at home to remind me of uh, not just today, but the, uh, the whole work in putting this place back together again. So it's, it's great to have such a sort of personal sort of memento of the place. And has it inspired you to maybe keep it up? I think, I think I'll be trying, uh, trying to do a few more. And whether or not they'll be as good as this one without your guidance, Dermot, but I'll, uh, I'll certainly be trying it again. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something. The next time you go exploring Everest or any other mountain... You'll come as well. No, 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 no. Throw a paint box in your rucksack. <laughs> right. Well, it may not be the Himalayas, but there are plenty of other beautiful painting locations to be found all over Ireland.